Okay, it's another episode of Coffee with Craner, episode 86, and today I have a, a guest that I actually uh, went along university with, Nico Fazio. He's a bit older than me uh, by a year or two, um, but a very impressive CV, and especially being uh, very young, and we're going to talk a little bit about his experience at the University of Windsor, at the Odette School of Business, and then also uh, some work that he's doing in the Big Apple, or, or some people call it Wall Street, or or New York City, there's many names for it, but it's a big city with uh, lots of people. And, you know, he's in a great place at NASDAQ as uh, one of the directors of uh, US Options. And before that, he was also uh, corporate development at, I don't even know if I can pronounce, how do you pronounce this company's name? Uh, TIFOS. It's an acronym for, a, it's a long name. It's the Toronto Futures Options Swaps Exchange. It's a derivative okay. exchange. <laughs> okay, I have no idea what that means, but <laughs> yeah. And then also, you know, he completed his uh, Bachelor of Business Administration, specializing in finance and minoring in economics from the University of Windsor. Also, the former managing director of Joseph John Simpson Odette Student Investment Fund. And then also something very cool, he founded the RBC Windsor Border City Financial Case Competition. So uh, he was very involved in finance, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a second. But Nico, to start, I hear you're a coffee drinker, you enjoy espresso, where in New York City is your favorite place for coffee? Yeah, so uh, I actually came kind of prepared for this question. So I actually probably started drinking espresso when I was like 13 or 14, uh, thanks to my grandparents. Um, but I, I don't typically drink espresso that much anymore. Now I actually just drink regular coffee. Mm -hmm. But my favorite place is, uh, oh, you can kind of see there. Uh, it's called Puerto Rico Importing Company. It, it's in the West Village uh, in New York. Um, this is organic French Peruvian. Um, every time I go in, I just ask uh, whatever they they like, and I just kind of do whatever they say. And so far, I haven't been disappointed. Um, and and actually, on the coffee note, so I have a contraption here. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these. Is that? It's a no. It's an all glass pour over. And I, I really should be a company ambassador at this point, um, but it's it's a it's an all glass pour over and it's super cool. Um, I don't have a coffee machine. I literally make coffee here with with a, a piece of glass. Um, it was purchased for me by my uh, very creative girlfriend, and I didn't know what to do with it, with it at first. And then I started using it, and uh, now I, I can't uh, say enough good things about it. It's called it's called a pure over. Um, What's the difference so, between that and a French press? I don't know. I have no clue. <laughs> I I know that this one it doesn't have like paper. It doesn't have because okay. I guess normal part. Like I I like to drink coffee. I drink a lot of coffee, but I don't really know too much about coffee. So when people see that I have this, like they're like, "Oh, you must really know what you're talking about." And the truth is, like, no, I don't. I just drink it. Um, yeah. But I had to show everybody because of how cool it is, and it's going to be done. Like the coffee's almost done. So yeah, I'm looking forward to to having that. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, now, just just moving a bit forward into uh, trading and finance. I mean, uh, I was very very impressed just being in university with you and just seeing you know how fascinated and interested you were in uh, the world of trading and finance. And I'm interested to know how did this interest start with you? Yeah, it, I would. It's certainly what you would call a, a non traditional path um, in high school. I actually thought I was going to be a music producer. That was like my thing. I was, I'd made beats and um, mainly actually for people like in New York, which is funny because I end, ended up here. Um, but that was my sole focus throughout high school, of course, and like getting good grades and all of that because maybe my mom might watch this, but um, that was, that was the focus. And then in 12th grade, for some reason, I wish I, I knew why I just started trading stocks, um, mostly small cap stocks um, as you do. And, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was interesting because I would actually, like, I could say that most of my early finance education actually came from the classroom, but it was just me trading in class. So my teachers, um, were, they were kind of equal parts, like annoyed, but also kind of like confused, <laughs> <laughs> um, because it, it just, it didn't really make sense to them. Like, what, well, why is this kid trading stocks in my class? He's supposed to be watching um a video for english class or or something like that um yeah but th that was my experience um just running into the markets with uh very little former well zero former experience and and very little formal training and 
just learning like what a market order is, uh, what a stop loss is, like what volume means. Um, that was all self-taught at when I was in when I was in twelfth grade. So it's actually kind of ironic that a lot of those concepts are applicable to what I do now. I'm working in like market structure, um, but that's how I started. And then, luckily, uh, I wasn't in that environment for too too long because I would have lost all my money. Um, but I went into university and at the University of Windsor, uh, and the University of Windsor has, as you know, a large Bloomberg lab with I don't know how many computers probably like I used to know I used to advertise it to people when they came in but um, tons of resources and I met some very great mentors who I always credit everything to and they know who they are but they basically took my enthusiasm for finance and turned it into a little bit more of a sophisticated understanding for finance so instead of just trading stocks to make money they taught me how to Oh, like if you look at the FA function on Bloomberg, you can look at the company's financials or the DES description function. So like I, I started kind of dipping my toe into fundamental analysis and understanding how companies work. And then that same group of mentors um, ended up uh, bringing me on some case competitions and then eventually empowered me to start my own case competition. But another big initiative, which I'm sure I'll get into at some point, is the mm -hmm. investment fund. Um, and I started as an analyst on the investment fund. So that is essentially how i went from somebody trading stocks on their phone in class for fun to somebody who became um i don't know a little more adept at at understanding business it's uh it's interesting and i guess would you would you say there's less of a risk being so young uh yeah i mean i was it was a small account um obviously um and it got smaller <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, it, it was, I'm glad I started when I did, I think. And mm -hmm. I'm also glad that I learned by experience. Um, everybody learns in different ways. Some people learn with books. Some people learn with videos. Um, I, I, I learned by doing. So that's why I guess the early experience kind of resonated with me. And I was um, willing to push forward when I uh, got more resources in university. What was the, uh, if you don't mind sharing, the first stock you picked up that you can remember? Mm -hmm. I don't remember the ticker, but it was an energy company and I bought it for no reason. Uh, I couldn't even, it's not even like I saw a tweet or, or anything. I just saw the ticker and I said, this is the one. And unfortunately I, I made a profitable trade, um, because you know, when, when you start doing that, then it could lead to, um, uh, overconfidence and, and there's tons of behavioral finance lessons that I learned without knowing I was learning them. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a Canadian, um, energy company and I don't remember the ticker, unfortunately. <laughs> And the reason was you just wanted to find a company and start. I, just, I, I guess I wanted to see like what, what the experience like of doing a trade was. So like, gotcha. I remember back at, and I think they still have this, but I was using um, a, a brokerage uh, TD and they had a trading password and I didn't know my trading password. So I remember sitting in the cafeteria at St. Anne's high school and um, trying to figure out what the trading password was and, and then another another funny thing I did when I first started trading was I was making I was trading U.S. stocks with Canadian dollars in, in very small amounts. So I would enter a stock at like a dollar, exit at a dollar ten, which is a, a profit even after commissions on the book. Or but then I discovered that I was actually losing money. My account balance was going down. I was making these trades, and then I noticed that it was the currency conversion costs and the FX that I was also trading on top of of the equity. So for a while i was actually on the phone with td talking to a broker having them manually reverse my trades which is like not good for their business i mean i'm a small yeah. customer it doesn't add up but like um you know it, they were like you know what kid you got to get some us dollars in your account and start trading <laughs> trading with us dollars i actually got kicked out of class once for being on the phone with a broker <laughs> <laughs> to reverse like a 200 hundred dollar trade yeah <laughs> well you have to start somewhere right and um at, you know, being, being young, 200 bucks is a lot, right? Yeah, sure. Especially seeing it decline. Yeah. yeah. So, um, now you're involved in the world of market structure and that was, a, a the topic for this, this interview is, you know, from Windsor to wall street and, and your career and, and, and now what's called market structure. I honestly don't even know what that is. What, what is this, uh, exciting you know, venture that you've been a part of now for about a year or so. Yeah. Um, 
Well, it's market structure has been around forever. And it was funny. I, I Googled market structure before this interview. I'm like, I wonder what the actual definition of market structure is. And there was nothing. Turns out, I guess to some people, it's called mo market microstructure. And microstructure, gotcha. I, it, it's like a part of market structure. It's more like the, the, the nuances. But mm -hmm. essentially how I would describe it is market structure is the wing of finance that is concerned with exchanges and transactions. So the things that I'm focused on from my day to day, it's not trading stocks. It's not buying things to make money. I'm focused on um, volumes. I'm focused on um, execution quality and transaction cost and flows. And um, basically it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a big world and it kind of blends itself into other areas. I would say like market structure would be under trading. But market structure also has an overlap with like law and, and regulatory policy. It's like a huge thing in, in policy. There's a bunch of big topics that are that are always in the news and, and stuff like that. So um, more specifically, I, I, um, I'm i on the options team at NASDAQ and options market structure is also very interesting. So it's been it's been a great learning experience. I mean, I can't say enough great things about NASDAQ in, in general. Um, it, I feel like everybody around me is a teacher and they all care about my growth. So um, it's been good. And it's, and it's very, very, very nuanced. Like we're talking like, Trading behavior is is consequential to, to the microsecond, um, and and how a participant is trading and how they're connected and um, where they're co located and um, it, it all it all factors into something. So um, from our end, we are the exchange. We're trying to make sure that um, we're trying to provide a good um, experience for, for our participants and exchange members. So mm -hmm. um, I would say that's market structure. You don't have to work at an exchange to to have exposure to market structure. I would say exchanges are, are at the forefront or center of the market structure world in many ways, but market makers and wholesalers, banks, um, some quantitative hedge funds, like they all have um, significant exposure to, to market structure and, and how things are transacted in finance. Is this something that you like thought of going into, or is it something that kind of you're, you know, you opened your eyes to after working at RBC and, and your time in university? Good question. Yeah. So no, I, I never thought of this. Um, essentially, my path was kind of university. Um, I did my first internship in commercial banking at RBC in Windsor. And then my second internship was in more of a capital markets banking role in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And then um, after that, I picked up a few contract jobs, one of which was more on the consulting side, the other was on kind of like the investment banking advisory side. So all the way from when I started university till kind of the end, even including my time on the investment fund, my focus has always been around companies and doing deals and um, not at all the nuances of fee schedules and, and trading allocation and stuff like that, which I'm mm -hmm. working on now. It, I basically, so my, my first job out of school is really, really important. Um, and again, I, I fell into this job through networking um, at the University of Windsor um, and I, I was working under uh, a mentor, James Beatty, who, who runs Tifos, and we, you know, I, I was working with him um, on some investment banking projects. And when I graduated, I ended up joining the company that he's the CEO of, Tifos. So, what Tifos was was um, an exchange um, that has not yet launched, but it's um, a derivatives exchange, so options and futures and, and some other things. Mm -hmm. And that was an interesting kind of turning point for me because. I was working there, as you said, I was a corporate development analyst. So corporate development is like M&A, raising capital, building um, pitch decks and financial models, like in really investment banking stuff. And I was doing investment banking stuff for a company that is in the world of market structure. So through my time at TIFOS, I kind of started fully on the corporate finance side, um, raising money and, and all that. And then by the end of my tenure there, I, I was starting to really learn more about how exchanges worked. I mean, when you build a, like help build a financial model for an exchange, you start to kind of learn like what the business looks like and how an exchange makes money and how different models can affect different um, financial consequences. So um, by, by the end of my tenure there, I, I thought, you know what, the exchange world is really cool. I'd like to continue working in the exchange world and in market structure, even, you know, more generally. So um, that that's how I got to market structure. I started in a in a very familiar world, as familiar as I could be a year out of school, um, which was the banking and corporate finance world. And then, I had a very unique, great, amazing opportunity. Another company that I can't say enough great things about, and, and everybody there who helped me. Um, 
I kind of fused my uh, my focus more towards something a little bit more niche. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, it's uh, when I when I was on LinkedIn scrolling through and just figuring out what what Nico was up to. I mean, the role that you're in. Uh, being a director uh, of U.S. Options at NASDAQ, that must be like a, a dream job for for a lot of students that are that are in the uh, in the lab at, at Odette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that resonates. That struck a chord, as you could see, because you're right. Like I, I basically lived in that place, right? Um, yeah. You know, I, I I spent more hours in that room than than my own home probably uh, at that time in my life. Um, because like it's full of good people and awesome resources, and, and you know those were some of the best years ever. Um, yeah, the the role's great. I mean, like it's it's a, it's a lot of responsibility, and I'm, I'm learning a lot. And everybody's willing to help. It, but like emphasis on learning a lot. Like there's so much. Um, but so far, everything's great. Clients are great. Um, I'm still you know ramping up. I've I've only been at Nasdaq for about eight months, almost eight months now. Um, time flies, but still kind of just getting getting started. But um, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I think my university self would be would be really thrilled. Oh yeah, for sure. Now, I mean, is there? A, I think there's a misconception that, and maybe I'm wrong, that you you work on Wall Street, you have no life. Is that is that what you're facing, or is it is it more structured and it's not what the movies make it seem? Depends. Um, big, big depends. So if you're looking at finance in general, yeah, like investment banking, private equity, hedge funds those roles um where you're where anything where you're like researching a company um considering taking a position in or um trying to win uh the mandate for an investment banking uh client or something like that when market hours don't really matter to you yeah like working hours can get can get long and, and um and stressful and obviously like these jobs they compensate you accordingly yeah. um but that's that's where the revenue comes from my, my job specifically it's, it's not really like that um as an exchange we are centered mostly towards market hours. So um, just like a lot of our trading clients, um, our focus is mostly just around the market hours and then whatever work we have to do afterwards. But it's not it's not um, lifestyle uh, uh, harming whatsoever. But it, it also kind of depends on, on what, in what world you're in. Yeah. Now, I guess, would would you say the, the labor intensive uh, crazy hours is when you're when you're on the trading floor? That's the type of um well i would there's a few different types of trading floor there's let's say you're at like a bank or like a market making firm and you're sitting in an office building and every person has like 20 screens in front of them like there's that kind of trading floor um and then there's like the pit right yeah. um so like in in the options world there are several options exchanges that still have trading floors one of our exchanges that the philadelphia exchange has a trading floor um and so, okay, I would say that type of trading floor probably is not known for grueling hours. Uh, and then if you're at, um, if you're a trader, any anybody who's trading usually has hours that are somewhat correlated with market market hours. Um, yeah. I would say if you if you thought of the the single segment of Wall Street that's working the longest hours, probably like a junior investment banker or a private uh, equity associate at, at, at certain firms. Um, and they're just in regular offices. They only have two monitors. <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, th this is a very exciting role and a lot of university students that I went with, uh, went to school with are involved in trading. They want to make it, you know, the market structure, f finance in general, they want to pursue a career in that. Uh, for you being in market structure and, and having worked in, in different finance areas, what's the best part of the job for those that are watching? Hmm. It varies per, per industry, but I would say um, usually in, in the world of, of finance, your, your actions definitely have consequences and you have a lot of responsibility. So if you're somebody who likes taking on a lot of responsibility, likes pressure, um, you know, uh, likes when things move fast, likes thinking really hard to solve problems and having those solutions make large dollar effects in mm -hmm. different ways i would say i would say finance is for you okay no that's that's and, and, and now obviously everything opposite to that would you know finance is not for you right um yeah if, if, if finance in general it's, it's super it's it's so vast right like you could yeah. find a, a job in i don't know like um 
real estate corporate banking that you might like or commercial banking or even retail banking or i guess it all kind of falls within finance mm -hmm. um it's it's you can you can really have any background and go into finance you can have an hr background and go into finance you can have a marketing background and go to finance um if you have an academic background you can absolutely go into finance um you know a lot of our clients are are heavy on that so um it's a big world there's something for you probably um and it's fun i, I think it's fun no it's interesting to hear what what your perspective is especially being so fresh out of university how you're liking this this career path so far and you know for the young young people that are watching or really any age that are perhaps thinking of of diving into this area you know to understand i guess the real world issues opportunities that that come with it um and and i just have two quick questions before you head out maybe they're not so quick but yeah no, no um how can how can somebody prepare themselves for this type of career that you're in right now um this specific career like what the role that i'm specifically in is not it's not a role where we have like an analyst class right like it yeah. there are some roles like take investment banking uh for example like you know you'll do your internships in second or third year depending on your university and then usually you know if you have a full-time job before you graduate um like just to me when i was in school like graduating without a full-time job like there was no concept of that and that's just because that's how um finance in, the, in these areas tends to be on the recruiting side so uh you know you'll you'll come in you'll graduate and you'll be part of like a summer analyst class and then you'll be part of like the analyst one class and you you have a bunch of peers that uh, are your age that may have gone to your school or, or other schools and then everybody kind of moves and at some point they move into different industries or they just continue going up into in this case what we're talking about investment banking um yeah. it, in the exchange world it's not as standardized and um process oriented like this job for example um especially as as a canadian um it took a lot of networking it was networking and that's how i got both my internships that's how i got both my contract jobs in university that's how we were able to get the case competition off the ground that's how i ended up doing the investment fund essentially like every single thing that i've done is a product of some relationship and one of the things i actually had written down to one of your questions here was what is like working on wall street like what mm -hmm. is immediately apparent is how how important relationships are like super super important at all levels too um so you know networking is is you know absolutely number one i would say uh what else is there networking getting involved which kind of ties into networking but getting involved and another thing like something that that i did is like yeah if there's a certain club that you you want to uh get into but it doesn't really exist at your school like you should just go ahead and and invent it um if you're if you're ambitious enough and, and uh passionate enough about it and you come with a calculated plan that makes sense your school will probably help you out i know odette helped me out with the stuff that, that we did mm -hmm. um so what else i would say those those are those are like the things that there's other things you can do right get good grades whatever but like those are the things that like are are very um uh uh significant in that way no it's good to hear and and you know the fact that you were you narrowed it down to two i think is it allows somebody that's that's watching right now to be more focused in, in what they're trying to achieve and and from from the root of it it looks like networking was a was a huge factor in you know where you are like without it i don't know without that that rolodex um of context that you had one thing doesn't lead after the other and, and that's really the fundamental um and now talking a little bit more big picture uh you're you're very early on in your career but you know um miles ahead of of of, of some other people that are just get getting started right out of university uh where do you see yourself in let's say five to ten years from now it's it's a big question but i'm interested in knowing kind of what the maybe the long-term goal is for you yeah this one I, I i i didn't get to this one this one i actually don't have an answer for but i'll do my best um i would like to be at nasdaq still um you know obviously it's a great company there's there's no uh reason uh to, to leave a, a company like this really yeah. however also um, life is life and things change and there's a lot out there. Um, I like market structure a lot. I think it's really interesting. I realize that I'm in a privileged position, um, to learn a lot about it. And that's what I've been doing every day. And, and that's what I get up excited every day to do. 
Um, but there's just so much out there. And honestly, some days I think that maybe, um, I don't know, maybe I'll do an MBA one day and, and either have that supercharge my, my current trajectory or, or pivot into something else one day. Uh, at the end of the day, like I'm, I'm really just kind of taking things day by day a year ago, a year ago, I would have absolutely no clue that I'd be in this seat right now in this city, in this job. And then a year before yeah. that, I wouldn't know where I'd be that year either. So like, just really taking it day by day, soaking everything up, um, meeting people, having a good time, um, continuing to learn. And um, I'm fortunate enough to be surrounded by amazing colleagues and, and leadership and, and good friends out here too. So that would be my kind of non-answer, but there's a lot of possibilities. <laughs> I think. That, that's awesome. And, and one non, you know, career related question. What do you enjoy doing after work? Uh, well, in the big city, in the Big Apple in particular. Yeah, I mean, I like socializing a lot. Uh, yep. And I have I have a good amount of buddies out here um, and, and awesome colleagues. And uh, there's a, a lot of great places to eat and drink in New York. Uh, that that is, com should come at no surprise. Um, too many good places, actually, because you want to try them all. And then you'll tell someone about the one place you went to. And then they're like, oh, no, you got to go to this place. And then, like, you know, next thing you know, you're there with that person. And. Um, so there's that at home. Uh, I brought my guitar from Windsor. I started playing guitar through COVID. So I've been playing a little bit of guitar, um, cleaning. This is my first time, like really living alone. Like I've moved away a few times, but this is my first time actually having my own place. So, uh, cleaning, trying my best to cook as much. Uh, sorry. I see a question actually, do you miss Windsor pizza? So I'm, I'm totally going to go off on a tangent here about Windsor pizza because <laughs> And any, if anybody, I don't know how, how widely this is being broadcasted, but if anybody at my work um, <laughs> is seeing this, they're definitely rolling their eyes right now because usually when I meet clients or, uh, or colleagues or, or anybody out here, they ask, oh, where are you from? Like, I'll give you a typical conversation. Where are you from? I'm from Canada. And they are, they're always like, oh, cool. Like, they're, they're super interested. <laughs> and they're like, where in Canada are you from? And I'm like, Windsor. And that's all I say, just to see what, what they'll say. And then some people are like, oh, yeah, Windsor. And I'm like, do you know what Windsor is? And they're like, no. So you get those people. <laughs> and then um, some other people are like, yeah, like, you know, when I was 19 in Detroit. And I'm like, yep, that's the place. Um, yeah. And then other people just don't know what Windsor is. So uh, to explain where I come from, I always use pizza. Um, but, you know, I'm in New York, right? And, like, Connecticut's right there. So it's kind of like a hard sell because there's really good pizza out here, like, you know very good pizza i as as oh, i yeah. used to cook pizzas in windsor so I, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart um but yes i i always talk about windsor pizza down here and uh, eventually i have to get some frozen pizza shipped down here for my colleagues to to prove to them that it has it has its merit but but honestly like the pizza in new york is oh, it's also really really good it's and and i i usually do do say that when I try to describe what Windsor pizza is like, shredded pepperoni usually is the one thing that wins people over. Yeah. Um, but also, like, if I had to compare it to any other pizza that I've had, it's probably most like New York pizza. Okay. And I got to try Connecticut. I hear, I hear it, New Haven has, like, very good good pizza. Honest question. Uh, is it All better right. than is, – is New York pizza better than Windsor pizza? Um, I would say and, – and I'll answer honestly, and this might disappoint yeah. some people. On average, Windsor Pizza, I've had better experiences with Windsor Pizza on average. Keep in mind, we're not dealing with a super big sample size down here either. But at this point, if you hook me up to a lie detector, I would admit that the best pizza I've ever had is John's of Bleecker in the West Village. Okay. Here. Well, this so, is a live show. People might hold you <laughs> to it. But, I mean, you're in New York right now, so you're safe. Nobody can uh, yeah, egg your exactly. house or anything like that. So. <laughs> There's not much to egg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have to throw pretty high up. Um, but no, Nico, this is this has been really really cool experience, especially being able to connect with you after you know a few years out of uh, out of university for yourself. And I mean, you definitely inspired me throughout throughout university. I'm not necessarily interested in finance whatsoever. Um, <laughs> Good. But but the but seeing your hustle in in university and just your passion for for the sport. I mean, uh, that was, uh, something that inspired me. And I, I imagine, you know, many people that have been popping in and saying good things, uh, would say the same as well. So 
Uh, thanks for making the time and uh, joining us from the Big Apple. Thanks for having me, Lyndon. And also, like, best of luck with everything that you've got going on at your on your end. Um, super impressive, and um, you've got my support for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Nico. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Mail in your ballot. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Take care.